Hello, uh, for those just entering the webinar, I'm going to wait um, on the about 30 more seconds to allow others to join and then we'll proceed with introductions. So please, uh, wait a second. <clears throat> Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your location. My name is Will Wong and I am a first year master in public policy program candidate at the Harvard Kennedy School and an incoming co-chair of the HKS Asian American and Pacific Islander Caucus or AAPI Caucus. Um, I want to start with a few announcements on the Ash Center's behalf. The Ash Center would like to First, acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst, amongst nations. We would also like to thank all of our co-sponsors for supporting today's event. In addition to the Ash Center, today's talk is co-sponsored by the Harvard Kennedy School, Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus, the Women in Public Policy Program, and the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at HAS, the Institute of Politics, the Harvard University Asia Center, and the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. This event is being recorded and the video will be, made public, will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel. You are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event. Please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them via chat. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker and moderator. Anisha Sundi is a research fellow, gender specialist at the Women and Public Policy Program at HKS. At WAPPP or WAP, she manages the Gender Action Portal, an online collection of exper experimental research summaries that close, um, that close gender gaps in economic opportunity, politics, health, and education. She is also the co-chair of Harvard's Women in Technology Plus Allies Employee Research Group that seeks to develop an IT community that is committed to increasing representation, retention, and advancement of marginalized genders. Carolyn Cho is the executive director of the Asian American Resource Workshop, or AARW, where she supports the leadership development and organizing around issues of racial, economic, and social justice of a diverse base of progressive Asian Americans. In particular, Carolyn has focused on leadership capacity building of Vietnamese American young adults in her own neighborhood of Dorchester. Carolyn received her bachelor's degree in sociolo sociology from Harvard College in 2013. Kathy Pham is a product leader, computer scientist, and founder whose expertise lies in the intersection of technology, public interests, and ethics, and whose work has spanned Mozilla, Google, IBM, the White House, and more. She is a faculty of product management and society at HKS and is also um, a faculty affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center, Shorenstein Center, Belfer Center, and the Center for Research on Computation and Society. Nicholas Sung is a second year student of public policy and the outgoing co-chair of the Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus at HKS. He studies promoting diversity and inclusion within the US Foreign Service and conflict uh, prevention in the Indo-Pacific. The moderator of today's discussion, Kauri Uriyama, is a, is a senior program manager for Ash Center Fellows Program at HKS. She is the founder of the Ash, um, Ash Center Staff Identity Group, staff representative of the HKS Diversity Committee, and is a contributing member of the Ash Center faculty slash staff steering committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Kauri. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Will, for um, the kind introduction. Um, and as noted earlier, Will is an incoming co-chair of the AK HKS AAPI Student Caucus, um, which has been a tremendous thought partner um, for the Ash Center, whether through our staff identity group or the events team. Um, so we really appreciate your support for this event. Um, just to briefly um, describe the context of how this panel um, came to be about, this panel was conceived right after the Atlantic, Atlantic, Atlanta shooting um, earlier in the spring, which has prompted a number of our AAPI colleagues in the Ash Center Identity Group 
Staff Identity Group to propose a series of conversations regarding anti-AAPI systemic barriers. Uh, because, you know, this, um, this is actually hardly a new phenomenon. It's, it's very old, it's new, it's always been here. It's very pervasive. Um, and anti-AAPI racism and misogyny aren't just about outright hate crimes or violence or visible harassments. These systemic barriers also happen in our very own neighborhoods, workplaces, and other communities here in Boston and within Harvard. These barriers are often very subtle, invisible, and unintentional. But that's exactly why they're so pervasive and difficult to call out and many of their voices and experiences go unheard. So in today's panel, we hope to highlight these various nuances, intersectionality and complexities surrounding these barriers as a way to trigger even more conversations down the road here at HKS and at Harvard more broadly. We have a couple of questions for our three distinguished panelists who will answer them from their respective vantage points as staff, faculty or, or student. We will then have Carolyn Cho, she herself a Harvard graduate, respond to them based on her extensive experience as an AAPI community organizer here in Boston. Are there similar challenges? How does her organization work with non-AAPI stakeholders? How do they give marginalized groups their own voice? I think these will be, um, her experience um, will be very relevant to what we will be talking about today. So with that said, um, let's move to the first question. Um, what are your top one to two challenges as an AAPI working, studying, teaching at Harvard? Um, and I will go in the order of, I'll have Anisha start first, just alphabetically, um, and then Kathy, Nick, and then have Caroline respond. So Anisha, it's all yours. Thanks, Corey. Um, and first, I want to thank the Ash Center for having me, and especially thank you for inviting people who have been organizing against anti-Asian racism for years, and also folks who are central leaders here in our HKS community. Um, it's really important to realize that many staff, students, faculty, leaders, alums here at HKS and Harvard have both lived experience and organizing experience against anti-Asian racism. So really excited to be um, here in conversation with all of you. Um, so in, in terms of challenges, Firstly, you know, I am heartbroken and outraged by the increase in anti-Asian violence since the COVID-19 outbreak a year ago. And at the same time, as Kauri mentioned, our community has known and seen that anti-Asian violence has been fueled by xenophobic rhetoric and by the lack of policies specific to our community for years now. Um, and that this anti-Asian racism exists in the context of other oppressive structures like misogyny, classism, and xenophobia. And so because of my role with WAP, I'm going to come at this from the, the gender perspective. Um, and wanted to clearly outline that Asian women, I think, in, from my perspective in, in research and organizing, aren't prioritized in the gender equity efforts more broadly in higher education and in diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, for example, there's a lot of gender equity research suggesting that women and marginalized genders across the board need the tools to be able to navigate their workplaces in order to better advocate for themselves, and that women thought when, when, when women actually violate their gendered expectations of what we expect of women in the workplace, they receive backlash in the form of not getting a promotion, not being heard, and more generally being iced out um, at the workplace. But I think these experiences and um, issues are really unique for Asian American women um, who are advocating for themselves in the workplace when they are told to lean in and advocate for their promotions or for career advancement. Um, and, and Asian American women specifically receive backlash because we are outside when we only advocate for ourselves we are outside that quiet submissive stereotype that is typically ascribed towards Asian women and this is especially pronounced in my experience when we speak up around diversity and equity initiatives in the workplace and I think this is a really great case study of the model minority myth which I know is a term that folks have been hearing and, and speaking about a lot and um, the definition of the model minority myth that I really like is um, viewing the model minority myth as a white supremacist political tool that uplifts, uplifts the achievements of, you know, Asians from certain educational and professional backgrounds and obscures the struggle of poor and working class and other marginalized Asian communities. Um, and this is speaking to some of the work that Carolyn does a lot in her communities around housing injustice, gentrification, and other systemic oppressions that 
um, more marginalized Asian American communities face. And so the way it plays out in this example of Asian American women in the workplace is that Asian women are typically seen in the model minority myth as intelligent and hardworking, but also passive and deferential, and especially deferential when it comes to issues of anti-racism and social justice. And of course, that is just not true in the community we are in. Um, so when we begin to speak out against racism, against misogyny within the workplace, we receive even more backlash due to us violating not just the gendered stereotypes, but specifically our gendered and racial stereotypes that are ascribed to us as Asian women. And I think the challenge, going back to your question, Corey, is coming down to a lack of analysis of how the system of white supremacy and the systems of patriarchy and sexism intertwine and affect pan-Asian women in really unique ways. And this gets even more complicated and nuanced and important to talk about when we realize Asian women or API women themselves don't all have the same experiences and untangling the issues that are central to South Asian women, to East Asian women, to Southeast Asian women, to Pacific Islander women and other marginalized genders is really important. Thank you so much, Anisha. Um, Kathy, you're next. Anisha, you're talking and I'm sitting here, just wanted to jump out of my seat and yell yes, yes to everything you're, you're saying. Um, Corey started out by mentioning the Atlanta shooting event and also talking about how some of these issues are not new and sometimes it takes really big events for movements to happen. Um, the Atlanta one for me really highlighted the importance of the conversation on intersectionality that we also have to recognize, and Anisha pointed this out as well. Um, when Atlanta happened, I just had a moment where I come from a family of Vietnamese refugees who are salon workers. And Atlanta was a really devastating example of class and gender and sex and racism all combined into one event where it was Asian women who worked in salons. And when you start unpacking that, there were other Asian people that were like, well, they were salon workers, they deserved it. Or there were um, men who made comments about the women's chosen profession. And there were, and there were lots to un unpack there. And to go back to your original question of what are some of the challenges um, facing someone of AAPI background in an academic setting at a place like Harvard. It's hard to pinpoint which of that is the, is it the gender component, the Asian component, the Vietnamese component, um, the class component. There's a whole hierarchy of, of class even amongst Asian communities. And, and I think what that, that leads to is one, it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly which I'll just share some experiences that I think might be related to, to some of that. Um, at Harvard, uh, I teach a class on product management and in some cases, and I've, I've also done a ton of work um, as an engineer, I've built sentiment analysis engines and a lot of machine learning AI type stuff throughout my career. And over and over again, I'll be in rooms with faculty members who do not have that experience and will explain my field to me over and over again. And Sometimes they do that to everyone else, but sometimes they just do it to someone who maybe looks like me. And maybe it's easier to do it to someone who looks like me. And we'll see that, I've seen that at Google. I've seen that at the White House. Uh, most recently during this presidential transition with an incredibly progressive president, still couldn't find a senior Asian woman for high level leadership positions. And there's a lot to unpack there, right? Of like what's led us to that point, despite there being so many Asian women who have started movements in government and policy and digital tech and in, in, digital tech and in, in digital government and civic tech. Um, why is it that there's like a certain level that folks can get to and, and not move beyond that? And so I think the answer to your original question is where there's lots of small things, I think. Um, and then you look at the highest levels and you're like, well, where are all the Asian people? Where are all the Asian women? Um, and then you like, start unpacking all the layers that led us to where, where we were. And I'll end with, um, I read Ellen Powell's Reset book a few years ago. And for those of you who are thinking about reading it, definitely have, I, I personally think it should have a bit of a trigger warning because it can hit pretty close to home. But Ellen had talked about how at Kleiner Perkins, a really prestigious, at least, to some folks, um, really prestigious um, venture capital firm, 
They were known, um, some of the partners are known for wanting to hire chief of staffs that were raised by tiger moms because with, with incredibly high pedigrees, so like Harvard Business School, like Princeton, Yale, all of the, the pedigrees um, and were a certain way into the role that was just short of being the partner so they can do a lot of the work. And I think if you start watching and paying attention, that is certainly prevalent around Harvard, is prevalent around all the places that have power of some sort. And so I, I think um, those are some of the challenges. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, Nick? Thank you, Corey. And thank you very much for this invitation to speak on this panel. I really appreciate it. I'd like to echo, actually, um, Anisha, I'm glad that we kind of did a tour tour de force and we even delved into um, the model minority myth already. I feel like that's really important. And um, for me as a student, uh, my point, uh, my biggest challenge kind of builds off of Professor Pham's question of where, where are the the AAPI, the, the Asian representation, especially at senior and executive leadership at the Kennedy School. I think that for me as a student and for many other AAPI students, we one of our biggest challenges is the lack of role models that we see at those senior ranks. I think that we can intentionally reach out to the Anishas, the Dr. Oriyamas, the Dr. Fams, but overall the institution is kind of predominantly, is dominated by white people, if I can be completely honest, and at the very senior leadership by, by white men. And this isn't me as an angry AAPI student saying this. I think that this comes through in HKS's own data. We brought up the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and they issue an annual report each year. And from, I think it was October of 2020, for faculty, if we're going to talk about institutionalized sexism, you have 70% of faculty being men. And then this disparity is further exacerbated the higher up the pecking order you get with 80% of full faculty members, full professors being men. If we're gonna talk about race as well, 80% of faculty are white and 76% of staff members are white too. And so maybe that's a lot of numbers um, getting thrown out, but um, something to maybe make this a little bit more tangible was my experience as a master in public policy or an MPP student. In our first year, I, I didn't exempt out of any of the core required courses. And so I had to take um, all 11 uh, of the MPP courses. And of my 11 classes, nine out of the 11 of my professors were white and 11 out of 11 were men. I don't think that you get to these numbers completely by accident. We need to acknowledge the institutionalized racism and sexism that exists at the Kennedy School. And so when I think about it for me as a student, my biggest challenge is finding myself sometimes asking, you know, do I belong? do we as AAPI students truly belong at this school, especially when we look at, to the highest echelons at the Kennedy School and see that, at least for me, it's I perceive it as AAPIs and especially AAPI women and non-binary folk, and maybe even broader too, um, maybe to lead into to, to Carolyn's uh, role here to kind of like make a broader uh, appeal, especially outside of the AAPI community to BIPOC women and non-binary folks that we are, it seems that we are intentionally excluded from the senior ranks of administration, um, faculty and staff at the Kennedy School. Thank you so much. I'm just overwhelmed with such great emotions um, that so many wonderful points um, and such important points have been raised um, by the three panelists. Um, and I'm happy to pass on the mic to Carolyn who can respond um, in her unique perspective as a community organizer. Carolyn? Um, yeah, thank you so much and thank thank you for having me and, and thanks everyone for what, what you've shared so far. Um, I will try to start to respond, but I think this is, you know, certainly an ongoing conversation. Um, and and yeah, so I guess first just to, um, I'll kind of go through uh, my experiences and, and a little bit of what I see as like what we need in the field to really make change. And I think it can fold on to the Kennedy School in some ways. Um, so yeah, I would, so I'm um, a Harvard College graduate. I graduated in 2013. And, you know, I, I would say from my experience across the university, I think, you know, I haven't, I haven't been on campus in a few years, but I think that, you know, everything resonates, right, with my own experience as an undergraduate. And I think particularly, I, I've thought a lot about how um, the Asian American experience is 
totally invisibilized across the university, right? That that anything, when you seek out things around Asian America, it is about um, Asian studies. And not that that is not part of all of our histories, right? But I think we look at things like Atlanta, and that is, to me, a deeply Asian American experience, right? Of race, class, and gender, um, as you uh, both lifted up, and Anisha and Kathy. And so, you know, how do we have space to really value and talk about and dig into our Asian American experiences, right? And that leads into them what happens in the field. So, you know, as a um, the executive director of a small grassroots local organization, um, and and a, a community organizer, you know, I think that we really um, have to invest in community organizing, right? So making change at the grassroots, bringing people who are impacted by issues together to develop the policy, the solutions we need, the alternatives we need, and to push for those at all levels, right? And then we also need services that are linguistically and culturally competent for our people. So many organizers I know spend so much time doing basic service work and interpretation work, right? Just like many folks did in their own families because um, the services are just not adequate for, for our communities. And then the third piece is we need legal advocacy, right? We need to advocate um, to support our folks to deal with the structural barriers and to make change in the legal, the legal system. And, you know, we, but we need those three pieces to be deeply connected, right? Because the, the organizing is not disconnected from the services and the legal advocacy is really rooted in what's happening on the ground in our cities, in our small towns, in our country. And so, you know, to me, that's what the sector needs. I think in Boston, we've done um, a, a good job of starting to build that infrastructure across, you know, community organizing groups like um, the Asian American Resource Workshop, our service partners, and our legal advocacy partners. And, um, and you know, at ARW, as Anisha, who is one of our board members, and we're so happy to have um, talked about, we really think about um, anti-Asian violence in the form of displacement. So what are all the ways that our community members are removed from our communities and not able to build the thriving um, neighborhoods and towns and cities that, that we know our people deserve and should be part of? Um, and then to move into, you know, kind of how you get folks on board and building across communities. So one thing, you know, we think about both um, intra and interracial solidarity. So as, as lifted up already, right, the Asian community is extremely diverse. And so there is work to do to, to um, lift up the diversity of experiences within our own community and do the work internally to build Pan-Asian, Asian-American, AAPI movements and spaces that actually represent that diversity, right? And name the specificity of the experiences. So I think that is, you know, step one. And then there's also, right, we need to be in solidarity with other communities of color. And, you know, the way that white supremacy and white supremacy culture show up in our communities, I think even at a place like the Kennedy School is specific, but we understand it as being connected to the way it shows up for other people of color and marginalized people, right? Um, so I think that is, you know, I, I think a lot about how can we both be specific and in a way that creates a broad solidarity. So both within the Asian community and, you know, with other communities of color, right? Because because the needs we have as, or you all have as Asian folks within the Kennedy School, right? We know are not disconnected from the need Black folks have, Latinx folks, Indigenous folks have in the Kennedy School, but they show up in a very specific way. And so how can we, we do both, right? Because the model minority myth is specific, but, you know, it's part of this broader white supremacy culture. Um, and then, you know, I think I think the last thing I'll, I'll say is just, um, I think even on campus, right, um, it is really around how do you organize, how do you bring people together to identify the issues, because we all know what the issues are from our experience, and to kind of come up with a collective platform to make the change you're looking for, right, because I think it is daunting one by one to try to push, and it's exhausting, right, because then you're just one person pushing and pushing, right, and I'm sure many of you are doing that every day, right, um, but when we actually build something that's more collective, that's a frame that can be across an institution or across a community, we're able to push uh, more um, broadly and more 
um, cohort in a more coordinated way. And I think that helps, you know, build toward what, um, what you all really want to be building, right, which sounds like more um, Asian American senior leadership, right, and, and more um, resources and services for Asian American students, and, you know, um, and, and other kind of pieces, right, that we've started to lift up. Um, so I think that I will um, stop there. Oh, and I guess, sorry, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop is just, then I think when you think about, right, allies more broad, so, so I think we all know, or hopefully we're understanding, right, it's about building solidarity across um, impacted and oppressed communities, but also how do we really um, make ourselves not invisible in the broader discourse, right? I think this moment has brought that up, right? When we think about, you know, from my vantage point, when we think about foundation dollars, when we think about um, many things, right? We we don't, Asian folks are, are left out of the conversation totally. So how do we really um, use this moment to lift up our experiences and the history and the length and the deep um, structural injustices um, and do it in a way that is not about pitting us against other communities um, and kind of which plays into the model minority myth, but is really about saying we are part of this conversation. We, we have the solutions we need and we need those to be resourced in a real way. Um, we need, you know, I mean, even just we need adequate language access and da disaggregated data for us to even understand what's happening in our communities. And we need to, um, you know, push for policy changes across the board to stabilize our, our people. So I'll end there. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, yeah, I've just been nodding this whole time, just strong nod. Um, yes, yes. Um, so thank you so much for your um, insights and responses. And, and you know, I. Carolyn's point about the services, the intentionality um, um, that's culturally competent, um, I really think that's a very, very important point. All your um, you know, three points are important, but that really speaks to me personally because I do believe that um, Harvard and um, higher ed um, often tends to kind of, it's not intentional, but um, I don't think they have a formalized or intentional services that's created for BIPOCs, uh, particularly for AAPI staff who's not, who may not be um, ready um, to be self-advocating for themselves um, in a system where self-advocacy is considered to be a very important component when you're um, thinking about career advancements um, or getting your voices heard. Um, and sometimes um, people just aren't even sure what to, where to start or which resources to access. There are resources out there, but they don't even know how to access them because they don't know people there or they're not made aware of these things. Um, so I think really that culturally competent service um, really spoke to me. And I think that's something that um, Kennedy School and Harvard more broadly can probably look into um, making it more robust um, for a, not just for AAPI cohorts, but for, um, um, marginalized identity um, affiliates. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, next question is, um, so despite all these challenges um, and the maintenance of, unfortunate maintenance of status quo at Harvard um, and in Boston, what are some of the things that we can do to uplift each other? Um, or are there things that in your own capacity or in your organizations that you've already been doing in this regard? Um, and I will start with Nick um, on this, um, Kathy, and then Anisha. Thank you, Corey. And I feel like this builds from Carolyn's point talking about collective action and, you know, it is exhaustive exhausting to push just individually and kind of independent of one another and so in how do we lift each other up i think that we lift each other up together both vertically and kind of horizontally i think that api caucus has been blessed to work with a lot of partner organizations at hugsy at the law school at the divinity school and we kind of have this uh, pan asian um, graduate stu student alliance um, that we've been very fortunate to, to work with again not only actually within the harvard community but also within the boston community as well i also think that i'm really pleased that we're having a, a discussion like this today um 
I think that this is exactly what we need. And to, to Carolyn's point too, not just also like having a discussion about this too, but linking maybe like legal, uh, not legal action, but like activism to the specific discussions um, as well. So something that makes me very happy and optimistic is that we're starting to see more and more intra and inter, as Carolyn was saying, coalition building um, within, within the Kennedy School. I think that one specific example for this, um, for AAPI caucus was Lunar New Year this year, in which many faculty members and staff members joined AAPI caucus. Over four days, we had over 10 events kind of celebrating our shared, um, shared history and kind of the shared celebration. And I think that obviously tragically after March 16th and the Atlanta shootings, um, we had a, we built on the this these informal and social events to have a deep conversation. Thank you very much, much Dr. Pham, and then also Professor Hong Chu joined us as well to kind of reflect and talk about many of the frustrations, anger, a lot of the resentment that was that was happening at least within the HKS um, student body at that time, um, and that really helped to, to process. So. As I think about how we move forward, it's obviously only it's the inter and inter intra and inter um, API coalition building, and then also reaching out to say the Black Student Union, Latinx Caucus, LGBTQ Caucus, Women's Caucus as well too, to move forward and make HKS and the Harvard community a more uh, anti-racist and anti-sexist institution. Kathy. I think this is a question of how do we bring people to the table, right? At this point, um, you know, I was reflecting on how I've, you know, I now teach at Harvard. I've um, worked in government. I've started an incubator um, where we funded a bunch of startups. And in every single one of those scenarios, I've seen so often how whenever someone needs a guest speaker, whenever someone is looking for a bunch of new startups to fund, looking for new faculty members, looking for the first hires into the White House for a new digital service team, it starts with personal networks. And that, that's just how it happens in so many places. And then what do personal networks look, look like? And then the first few hires, the first people we bring in have like this cascading effect on what things look like much later on. Um, and so, to rethink how we do that both not only there's some responsibility to bring people in the room but also to recognize that when people are missing in the room how do we take on the responsibility of bringing those perspectives into the room um there was a, there's been a few questions of how do you know we stand with different other uh, marginalized groups um how do we stand with the black community how do we stand with so many different communities that are experiencing so many different kinds of racism and misogyny, et cetera. Um, and I feel that deeply as an Asian American woman, how do I think about other groups that, that I can bring to the table? Because in the absence of that, we miss so many perspectives of what that looks like. And there, there are a few questions on, you know, why does this matter of who's in the room, right? Like diversity of thought is important. Diversity of thought, as you know, is sometimes um, a proxy for not having more diverse people in Sarum, well, what that looks like is um, if you look at the clinical trial demographic information, for example, for Moderna, um, for the vaccine recently, 79% of that, 79% of the people who were in the clinical trials were white. Um, so what does that mean for everyone else in, in the US that is looking to get a vaccine when you hear about blood clots? And if you even go down a little bit further, I've been in rooms of people looking to reach out to communities to talk about like either clinical trials um, or, or like user research or something. And sometimes it's like as simple as, does anyone know anyone from an Asian community that I can talk to? And that when you're in like a fast paced environment and you don't know anyone, you just kind of glaze over it. And that's why it's so important to have people in the room to know which communities to go to and which communities to talk to. It could be about vaccines. It could be about a new policy that you're gonna roll out. It could be about a new piece of technology that you're gonna launch. Um, you know, we see this with tech companies launching in regions where they have no idea what the political climate is, the social economic climate is, and you, you launch a piece of technology and all of a sudden it's being used to propagate certain kinds of information that leads to mass killings, for example. Um, and that often can be traced back to 
a lack of understanding of different communities in which you're trying to serve, different communities in which you're trying to teach, different communities in which you're trying to build technology for, build policies for. So it's on us if, if we are in, it's on the folks who are in positions of power, which I in some ways consider myself in now because I, I get to teach at this place at Harvard. Um, how do we bring in different speakers? How do we bring in different panelists? How do we have a reading list that represents so many different voices and not just whatever the status quo or normal reading list is? How do we change every little piece of it and, and so many different parts, right? From who we talk to, who we bring in, who we do research with, our staff, our leadership. It takes all of us figuring out how to shift the needle in all of these levels, um, I think, to, to see that. And I think it's really, I mean, I, I feel that responsibility deeply um, in my day-to-day -day role and how to bring, how to both exert any influence I have to bring folks into the room, but also um, in the absence of having those people in the room, how do I either bring their voices, their readings, their perspectives in, in some form? Thank you, Kathy. Anisha? That was great. And I, I think I'm going to keep it short and echo what a lot of what folks are saying, because I was also going to talk about um, something beautiful I've really seen in the past couple of years is the continued rise of um, Black and Asian solidarity movements in our work. And I think the cross-racial solidarity work is happening here at Harvard, especially across employee resource groups and across, I think, research centers a little bit in the past year, um, that there is still so much that needs, so much more of this, as Kathy was saying, needs to be done. And I will say, especially at the Women in Public Policy Program, which is a space that has historically centered, you know, cis, straight, white women's experiences. How can we partner more with practitioners, organizers, folks with lived experiences who are doing racial and gender justice work instead of just you know academics and researchers and bringing those into the fold as well um, but going back to this point around cross-racial solidarity um, and I'd love to hear Carolyn expand on this a little bit in her comments but I've been seeing pan-Asian organizations response to the hate incidents that have been happening um, the really important thing that I've been seeing is that some of these responses aren't rooted in increased criminality or increased funding of the carceral system because Asian American folks are are realizing that that inherently hurts our black and brown communities and partners. Um, so, you know, tomorrow is the one year anniversary of George Floyd's horrific death and, you know, the the following movement for Black Lives rallies that have called for defunding the police. But at the same time, we're seeing these bills and legislation come in that call for hate crime legislation and increased um, hate crime legislation leads to harsher sentencing, mandatory minimums and punishments that are um, targeted primarily towards the Black community. So how are we having this call for defunding the police while also having this call for increased hate crime legislation? And organizations like ARW, Red Canary Song and so many other grassroots collectives have actually come together to say, you know, our work is rooted in cross-racial solidarity, and these bills miss the mark by prioritizing policing. So really viewing our goal, um, as everyone was saying, as collective liberation against the tools of white supremacy that hold all of us back has been really beautiful to see. And it's beautiful to see that solidarity work happening here in Boston across organizations that recognizes that addressing violence against the Asian community shouldn't include furthering policies and stereotypes around Black criminality. What it should Include, as Carolyn was saying, is in language resources, access to health and mental health care services, safe housing, fair wages. Um, but I'll let Carolyn take over because I know she's been at the forefront of this work. Thank you. Um, yeah, you've already answered some of the questions that's in the Q&A panel. Uh, there, we have gotten questions related to that, um, just in terms of how to work with other BIPOC communities and um, Things, things of that sort. So yeah, no, I think this is coming together nicely and I love that the um, audience's interest and then the panelists expertise is meshing very nicely. Um, so Carolyn. Um, yeah, thanks Anisha for that. And I just put in the chat um, uh, an article about, about the hate crime legislation. I was just trying to pull up. There's a, there's a good policy guide from some of the national um, progressive Asian advocacy groups that I'll put in the chat in a, in a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I think on the, you know, well, one thing I was thinking about as you were, as you were speaking, Anisha, so I'll just add to, um, is, is how do we both, um, both, right, assess policy from a place of like, how does it, how does it support us and also other marginalized people? 
And the other piece we've been thinking about is who is who is left out of the Asian American discourse in this um, in these conversations. So specifically, right when we think about criminalization. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work locally and nationally around Southeast Asian deportation, which um, which for us has has really meant highlighting the experience of folks who came here as refugees from the war, from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, uh, who grew up, you know, 1.5 gen, grew up here in the U.S., have U.S.-based criminal records as U.S. children, young people who, you know, were resettled into um uh, working class black and brown neighborhoods and now are facing deportation right to countries they may have never lived in um, due to these US criminal records. And they are, those folks are always left out of the immigration conversation, right? Because that is not what people want to talk about, but they are part of our community and it is part of a history and a, a set of um, structural and policy decisions that, that led to this, right? And so when we think about things like, um, you know, not non-carceral solutions, we are thinking about it both because we know that Black folks are disproportionately targeted by these policies and because we know that the people who are most marginalized within our own communities also have been impacted by these systems, even when they're left out of kind of the dominant Asian discourse, right? So, you know, just wanting to lift up, I think it's both, like, in terms of how we how we lift up those experiences as well as, right? And, and I think you see the same thing, like when we talk about increased funding to FBI, right? Like we know that Muslim folks within our communities are going to be, are always targeted by kind of like terrorist um, designations and, and, and policies, right? So, so yeah, I just, just wanted to lift up that I think we, we need to do the work of both telling all of our community stories and telling the story of why actually we get to be safe and everyone gets to be safe, right? And there are solutions that can get at the root of that. Um, so I'll just leave it there, I think. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll move on to the last question, um, which is <laughs> the convoluted question. But um, so last question is, what is the one single thing you'd like HKS to do, HKS or Harvard to do right now, right here in this moment, to change the status quo for AAPIs. And I will start with Kathy, Anisha, and then Nick. I've been thinking about this question all weekend. <laughs> and it's really hard, um, in part- I didn't make it easy. <laughs> it, well, in part because, candidly, when you look at a place of so much power and influence and you watch the same things happen over and over again, and you watch students, um, you know, Nick and all of the folks before you and Will who have really advocated for change and written letters to deans and mobilized, and then you watch things say the same. It's hard to even know what to say about that. Um, and so I think, I wonder if the, the only thing really is to take some of these, um, like this collective action and things people are saying to take them seriously, to do something about it, to not um, only have lip service and take the meetings with the students, but then actually not do anything about it or um, do just enough where it might seem like, you know, you, there's like a big letter that's sent out from leadership and then um, at the end of the day, nothing really changes. And I, I think it's maybe just listen to all the work that's already been done the past few years and when people raise issues and, um, you know, there's faculty members here who have made comments about Asian women's bodies and who've been really inappropriate and and sexist and racist and they're still here even after they're associated with the center um, even after multiple reports um, and so it's hard to know what's the one thing beyond perhaps just taking seriously what's already been brought to the institution. Thank you. Well, that kind of speaks to the point about, you know, all these listening sessions, right? Um, if they're not processing it, what's the point of listening, right? Uh, and there already has been a lot of events surrounding doing like listening events and um, town hall meetings. Um, but I think you're right. It's, it's really validating and acknowledging these voices, right? You can't just be listening to them. You need to acknowledge those concerns. And what usually happens is, well, I've listened, so let's move on. And that's, listening is not an end to itself. 
it's, it's really what's beyond it is to acknowledge these pains and these voices. Um, that's the only way to move forward um, and validating their voices and, and, and elevating them so that then we can collectively brainstorm what can we do together. And I think that's something that we, I agree with you, that's tend to be missing in a lot of these events um, that they tend to be one-off events. So thank you, Kathy. Um, sorry, um, who was, who did I say next? <laughs> <laughs> was it Nick or Anisha? Anisha. I can go. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kathy. I, I completely agree with you. And I, I think uh, overall, I wish some of these conversations, as we were talking about in our pre-meeting, become ongoing instead of just reactive. And I would love for institutions like the Kennedy School to commit to an actionable plan that has them engage with these issues over time in a sustained way, rather than, you know, just the one statement or just one email that might share some great resources, like you were saying, Kathy, um, but have little accountability and overall action towards anti-racism and racial justice work on a on a continued ongoing basis. Um, and so to get to the one thing, I think HKS could do something that I think is really important when we are grappling with these issues of violence and xenophobia and racism is having affinity spaces in predominantly white institutions like Harvard. Um, and affinity spaces can, can provide opportunities for you know, dialogue around history, around culture, obstacles, achievements of Asian American folks or other marginalized groups, but they can also provide an opportunity to have your experiences and concerns validated in a way that they aren't in some other predominantly white spaces. Um, like I mentioned earlier the, around the question around Asian American women getting backlash for violating their gender and racial, racial stereotypes, the burden and emotional labor of navigating that, especially at an institution like Harvard, can be really, really hard. So I think these affinity spaces can be really important, and it's also really important to make sure that people who run these affinity groups and spaces on campus are compensated, have funding, and have the resources to be able to hold these spaces without getting burnt out. I think that's really key to this work as well. So as much as I want to say, you know, here's the one thing we can do to dismantle white supremacy and dismantle the systemic barriers that lead to these kinds of um, anti-API stereotypes, I also want to provide space and healing for Asian American folks, um, especially women of marginalized genders um, who are dealing with these issues on a daily basis and have to navigate really unique circumstances in the workplace and out in the world. So uh, shout out to Kari for, you know, running a really great staff affinity group here at HKS. Shout out to the Association of, of Harvard Asian and Asian American faculty and staff who have been in place for over 10 years and have been doing this great work of holding spaces for education, but also for healing. Um, and again, just want to mention again that I think these roles should be compensated and sustainable for them to actually have a meaningful impact on campus. Spot on, Anisha. Thank you. Nick? Oh, I'm just nodding my head over and over again. <laughs> I very much agree. I'm glad that Anisha, you brought up the these affinity groups. Um, I feel like API caucus, at least for students, has been around for for a while, and I'm glad that to the previous question, we're starting to make these connections between staff, faculty, and students, and moving forward. I also like that, and I hope that more paid positions, at least for students, um, are being compensated with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. I know that there's been a couple of those associates, and I hope that that gets expanded as well. And then to Professor Pham, oh my goodness, yes. I feel like sometimes we just have conversations just for the point of having conversations and there's no actual tangible action items afterwards too. So I really hope that uh, at a very base level, there is not only just like listening, but active listening with the intent to have outcomes and, and change into the future. I think for me, related to kind of the major challenge that I was seeing, not having maybe so many role models in senior leadership and an executive leadership at the Kennedy School, um, that who look like me, who look like me, is the hiring of more AAPIs as well as AAPI women and more broadly BIPOC women and non-binary folks into these roles with proper funding and resources there. I think at the end of the day, one of my friends who's in uh, Latinx caucus, I don't know if she's on the call, but she likes to say culture eats strategy for lunch every day. And so we can have as many changes to rules and regulations as we want, but at the end of the day, if the people who are in position to power walking the corridors doesn't change, then I don't know if we're actually gonna get any substantive change in the end. How we do this as a student, maybe it's a little bit difficult for me to say. I don't think I'm in the inner workings or quite know the politicking um, from behind the scenes, but um, one of the things, Nisha, you're mentioning was proper funding. And uh, for me, 
uh, AAPI Caucus has enjoyed working with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, but I would love to see them with more resources, funding, and staff to kind of build on the work that they have started to do. I mentioned this annual report. I would love to see that expanded. And um, one of the things that AAPI Caucus has, has advocated for is an expansion of that annual report and to, for that data to be disaggregated. So not only collecting and publicizing data by, by race and gender, but also race and ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, so that we, there's a little bit more internal and external accountability for at least the domestic population here to more fully reflect the, the full diversity of the US population. I think that there could even be, maybe this is like pushing it a little bit further, but potentially um, baking into performance and evalu evaluative reviews for senior um, leadership tracking using those diversity, equity, and inclusion reports that are measured by the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging and seeing if senior leadership is actually making any progress towards making the Kennedy School, school more inclusive. I think that that would go a long way. Again, I'm just a student and maybe there are better ways to, to do this, but I think that hiring more people at the very top and change, starting to change the culture that way by who is actually filling this hall would go a long way in addressing anti-AAPI, anti-Asian biases and broader, make this institution more anti-racist and anti-sexist. Thank you, Nick. Um, Caroline, if you could respond like in terms of like whether um, there's yeah. overlaps of what you've been doing and, and within your organization. Yeah, I mean, I, sorry, yeah, I think, um, one thing I'm, I think, you know, in a city like, um, or an area like Boston, Cambridge is, you know, there is not um, always as much, I think there's a lot of emphasis at places like Harvard in terms of national partners, right, national um, organizations, nonprofits, but, you know, Harvard is a big player also locally, right, in our region. And so, um, you know, I sit on the board of the Phillips Brooks House Association, that's really um, the work I came up in as an undergraduate. So, um, that's like the social service and, and social action kind of home, um, at least for the undergrads. And, um, and you know, um, at PBHA, we really emphasize working with community. And so I first, um, you know, came to Fields Corner in Dorchester as a PBHA volunteer running summer camp and now have been doing like systemic change work in the neighborhood, you know, for 10 years. And so I think um, I see, the, you know, I see pockets of real investment within the university um, to, to local communities, but I don't think it extends across the board. And I think it's more challenging at the graduate schools because folks are coming for such short amounts of time sometimes and then leaving. Um, but I do think that there's a way that we need to really push to invest in local relationships, local struggle and connecting with local organizations and partners as part of this kind of broader push that y'all are, are sharing. And I think it speaks to something Anisha said earlier around who's considered an expert and, and that kind of piece. Um, but yeah, really agree with, with what everyone's saying around that. I think it's around creating the space, but not just creating the space, but pushing for real um, steps to start to be taken. I think we see that at all levels of our advocacy, um, but would also just include the piece around local um, local engagement and local and, and, and uh, connecting local work to the work at the Kennedy School. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll, um, we'll move on to the general Q&A. Um, I know we're close to time, but we, some of us, um, the panelists will be able to stay a few minutes behind, a few extra minutes um, to address some of these questions. But um, let's um, first go with the question regarding a glass ceiling um, or what some people call a bamboo ceiling. Um, because this is tied, somewhat tied with this whole notion of toxic, um, toxicity of model minority myth, right? Um, oftentimes AAPI candidates are usually not deemed to be leadership potential or they're not proactive enough. Um, and it does happen in senior executive searches and it, it, even in junior level or mid-level manager performance evaluations, I've heard of cases in which um, step AAPI people would be trying to self-advocate and they would be told, well, you're not proactive enough or, um, well, this is an external facing um, responsibility kind of in, implying that, you know, as Asians, maybe we're just not leadership worthy. Um, and these are all implicit things that they're not saying it intentionally, but but they, we see that these implicit judgments and biases are baked into these um, 
um, performance evaluations and assessment, and that does impact um, a professional growth and career potentials. Um, so yeah, um, any, anybody wanna take a first stab at it about glass ceilings and um, what we can do to combat it? Kathy? I think perhaps this might also just go back to um, over time, having people in the room to help make the decisions on who gets to be on the faculty, people on, um, you know, I'm on a few boards now, but people on, and, and when you're on a board, you help decide like who the new executive director or CEO is for like another organization, right? And it takes having different perspectives to even recommend the people who you should like hire for the CEO position. Those kinds of searches are actually pretty narrow. Um, and I think that's um, one part of it. I recently got, uh, had the pleasure of hearing from um, the CFO of Medilla, um, who is a, a Chinese woman who talked about, you know, sort of her, her journey of getting to where she is. And sometimes it's also just leaving an organization where over many years, no matter what you do, they just will not recognize that you're, you're incredibly qualified well overqualified for that role and just won't promote you into it and finding the place, unfortunately finding the place that will allow for that. Maybe it's not Harvard, maybe it's not the Kennedy School, maybe it's another school at Harvard, maybe it's somewhere else that will recognize that um, there's a role, like a leadership role that you would excel in and be great at and that their criteria for what that leadership role is, they recognize all that makes up all the people on, on this call. Um, because if we go by the status quo of what job descriptions historically have been and what background and pedigree we historically think are valuable and powerful and good attributes for leadership, then I'll probably point to, I think this the same type of person. Um, and so I think part of it is getting to the point, so to like summarize part of it is getting to the point where we have people in the room to help vote on, recommend, decide um, who gets to be in those leadership roles. Um, like if you just looked at like the transition team for this last presidential election in the United States, those, those people help determine who was gonna be in the next leadership role. And the other part um, is on an individual level, sometimes just having to go and find that organization that will recognize all the potential we have to offer because you can just push so much and some places just won't change for a really, really long time. I can jump in as well. Um, I think Kathy's definitely right. And Kara, you're also mentioning coming coming back to the model minority myth that I think this idea comes from the stereotype and, and misconception that Asian Americans, you know, flourish in the workplace and that reinforces that meritocratic illusion of Asian success and how Asian folks have been able to overcome kind of all these um, different types of oppressions and issues um, and that the Asian leadership gap can be resolved through hard work and we don't need programs or initiatives to really address this. But I will say a key thing to target, I think, when we talk about the glass ceiling for AAPI women um, is ensuring that our DIB initiatives take AAPI concerns and issues into consideration and center that in, in our work as well. So whether that's, you know, um, kind of the interpersonal individual work like career advancement opportunities or development that focus on Asian American women and marginalized genders, or is it, you know, the systemic issues? Can we debias our promotion procedures? Are there systemic issues that are inherent? Can we be collecting, you know, data on who is promoted, who isn't promoted, um, and keeping track of that throughout time so that we have a baseline and that we can hold ourselves accountable as an institution to making sure we don't fall to that stereotype of, you know, there isn't an Asian leadership gap because, you know, of the model minority myth. Yeah, anyone else want to jump in or should we move on to the next question? Okay. Well, All I right. would just say to what Anisha yeah, said, I think it goes back to what Nick said too. And also how do we make sure we're disaggregating that when appropriate, because I think, you know, um, as a, a Chinese American person, you know, I think, you know, obviously even within the Chinese community or the Indian community, it's very bimodal. There are a lot of very working class folks and a few very wealthy folks and it, um, it obscures, right? The reality of what's happening. But certainly then when we look across ethnicity, there's some real like 
deep differences in terms of who even is getting those kind of model minority positions. So how do we make sure not in a way because it's not to be divisive, right? It's to say like, this is really the reality of all of our communities and how can we um, lift that up as part of kind of these, these efforts that folks are talking about. Great, thank you. Um, actually, so Will um, has graciously been monitoring the Q&A panel in the chat um, and I think um, he can also bring in some questions, Will? Thank you so much. This was a fascinating discussion. Um, there's a few comments in um, the Q&A about um, aid guys in education, specifically about um, how can um, how can we tackle challenges faced by API in education? How about teaching API history and politics, especially in our K-12 system? Uh, what strategies do you have uh, for integrating more um, API um, histories and just um, teaching that in, in our public education system? Does anybody want to take a first stab at it? And it could be about like, you know, as a student, um, Nick and Will, like, um, are, are you seeing like AAPI related um, curriculum or, or courses um, at the Kennedy School? Or um, is that like an elective thing? Or, and that might speak to the I think, broad, that, we're, right? I think that we're beginning to see this and um, you have DPI 385, which is a course on racism and public policy, which is now has been piloted last year. Will took it um, as a first year public policy student and is now being expanded to the mid careers and the masters of public administration international development program as well. So that one is being expanded to, to talk about um, how racism affects public policy. And I think that this is a, a, a really important move that to acknowledge the, the people who I feel like have really fought for this have been staff and faculty members, but also student led equity coalition of which the AAPA caucus is, is part of working in tandem with Black Student Union, Latinx caucus, LGBTQ caucus, women's caucus, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that th there are positive moves to start learning about AAPI history. Um, and I think that these are, this is really positive. Talking about like K through 12 and also well, maybe continuing the conversation about education. I think that the framework is is slow is for by which we start to understand this is beginning to change, and I think that's also a positive direction. Um, Heather McGee, who is the the president, I think, and CEO of Demos, recently wrote a book called The Sum of Us, and we've been talking about how anti Asian, anti API biases and racism really affects the API community. But I think that building out of that framework too, it doesn't just affect the AAPI community. When we're talking about the, the glass ceiling and the bamboo ceiling, and um, I think that not having AAPI representation doesn't just harm AAPI communities, but it also harms Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and, and, and white people too. At the Kennedy School, for example, when we're not including AAPIs in the discussion, we're missing our voices and we become less stronger as an institution too. And so I think that when we're only taking from one specific demographic group that we all lose. And so I think that that conversation is beginning to change and we're starting to see some movement. And we see that now from a student's perspective with this course DPI 385, which is a, a very positive, uh, that's a, I feel like this is a very positive move um, being taught by um, Professor Khalil Muhammad. Well, to add to that, and you know, I'm channeling what Nick said earlier, um, who, who well, you channeled of talking about how culture is such a big part of all this. Like, what would it look like if, from a young age, we'd normalize so many of these stories, and not just Asian stories, um, like Latinx stories, Black stories, so many stories, so that we're not only talking about, you know, when something when something comes up, it's not only the shooting in Atlanta, or it's not only ways in which we're marginalized. Celebrating the the different holidays and celebrating how um, people have just like normal everyday stories of like, you know, kids read all these like books about um, like all sorts of, all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and how do we normalize that these are just communities and people living their normal life. They have books about um, loving kitties and books about cooking food and just very normal things. Um, our local library actually had um, grab bags and they put in books both for Black History Month and AAPI Heritage Month. And there are books I've actually never seen before. And they were just very normal books. It was a book about a girl learning how to use chopsticks. And it was a book about um, 
a young girl and her Japanese grandfather. And these are just very normal things. So how do we normalize these stories as just other common stories and not only talk about the hate crimes and the big events? And those have to be discussed as well with critical thought. But how do we also talk about it as if they're also just, these are just other people (laughs) who also live normal lives um, as well. And then, oh, sorry, Nisha, you want to go? Sure. Um, I, I mean, may, I'll be short, but and maybe this isn't a K to 12 point, but uh, though I know there's a ton of youth organizations who do this work, but for college age folks or, you know, people who are looking for a political home and want to build their base, ARW has been an amazing organization. Um, I've learned a lot about the Asian American community in Boston and, and our roots in organizing. I've learned for, like in terms of education, learning about issues like queer and trans API history to abolition perspectives to facilitation and organizing skills. So just a plug for folks who are looking for their political home in Boston might be uh, looking for an API political home. Um, ARW is a great organization to check out that has really strong roots in organizing that um, also allows space for political education that is really vital to our movement. Thanks, Anisha, for the plug. And and just um, there's also, a, at least in Massachusetts, there actually is a state bill on um, ethnic studies in schools. I think the big thing we're seeing now too is um, pushing for ethnic studies in school districts, as well as um, providing the resources for teachers to actually be prepared and ready to teach ethnic studies, right? Because it's one thing to want it to happen. And I think we even probably know from our college and graduate experience that there's another thing for folks to really be the right people to teach the classes. So how do we both push for ethnic studies in our school systems, which I think there is more and more legislative push to do at least here in Massachusetts and um, invest in the kind of pipelines for teachers and teacher training we need to make those programs really impactful for people. Thank you. Um, so one last quick question from the audience. Um, so um, there's a question, a couple of questions regarding um, how has um, the HKS AAPI community, whether student groups or otherwise, um, been working um, in solidarity with other communities of color to combat racism? Uh, maybe this is a good segue for Nick um, in terms of, um, I know that you've already mentioned about working with Black student unions and other um, Um, organizations, but maybe you can also supplement with a couple more examples. Sure. Again, this is uh, mainly working under the framework and this umbrella organization called the Evie Coalition. I want to give them as much props as possible because I feel like they have been truly instrumental in being in spearheading a lot of these initiatives, especially related to anti-sexism and anti-racism at the Kennedy School and at the Harvard community. Some other initiatives um, were, as I talked about, this this core course, um, which has been expanded to other programs at the Kennedy School talking about racism and public policies and also having um, an intersectional framework as well. Um, I think that there have been pushes by the Equity Coalition as well to start doing some more cluster hiring of uh, of faculty that are focusing on critical race theory, um, but also BIPOC uh, women and non-binary folks to be hired in, say, non-critical race theory to talk of, to to be hired in uh, other fields that are not necessarily related to that, or especially related to like API professors or people of uh, professors of Asian descent. I feel like sometimes um, they get pigeonholed into Asian uh, language courses or into to quant skills classes too, and so expanding, expanding that. I also think that um, Latinx Caucus led a fantastic effort in, in the fall of this year to reach over 500 um, BIPOC student applicants, targeting them, working with them to help them with um, their admissions essays um, and kind of creating linkages between our student caucuses and, and organizations. Um, and some of these applicants in order to make sure that moving forward, the student body has a a larger representation um, from black indigenous API, uh, Arab American uh, Americans at the school too. And I think that this is really important. And as Anisha was mentioning related to paid positions too, I think that another thing that Equity Coalition, API Caucus and all of these um, affinity groups have worked for is having, trying to have more 
uh, built in and paid student positions um, working in tandem with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and Belonging. So those are some of the, the things that at least we're working on in tandem with Equity Coalition, Black Student Union, Latinx Caucus, LGBTQ Caucus, Women's Caucus, the list goes on. <laughs> Well, thank you for I'm all gonna add to that with yeah, like ahead, a Jeff. really real talk moment where a hundred percent on paying students and anyone working on these issues. One of the advice I got from another faculty member when I first got to Harvard was two things. Utilize all the free student labor that you can because they'll do anything for you and um, people will do anything for the Harvard name. So just know that and use that to your advantage. Both of those advice I do not take and look for funding to pay for any student that works for me and anyone that does anything with Harvard. Um, but places of power have such a responsibility to pay for people to do the work because otherwise the people who can do the work are the people who can afford to not be paid. That applies to Harvard, applies to government, applies to so many institutions. So if there is a call to action from your second question earlier, it's yeah, let's make sure we pay people to do the work so that people can do the work. And I also think that I totally agree. And I also think there's this collective mentality about, well, I don't know how to do this work because I'm not, I'm not BIPOC. So, you know, just kind of delegating it to the bulk of the hard work to BIPOC or marginalized identity people. And that really has got to stop. It's, it's because this is mentally tolling, it's exhausting. And it's a lot of, it's, it's not all roses and rainbows at all. It's a lot of it is struggle after struggle. And, and really like the leadership and people in power need to acknowledge that, um, that this is really hard work. And a lot of the hard work is placed on these marginalized identity people. Um, and you really just can't be delegating it or hiring a couple of DIB staff and check, just check, check, check. That's that's not how it works. It really has to be, we all have to work together, has to be baked into everyone's um, daily work, not just, not even calling it diversity work. It really has to be, the equity lens has to be permeating into all of our everyday, like work, work lives and studying and all that. Um, so I totally agree with you. Anyone else wanna jump in, Anisha or Carolyn? Yeah, I can jump in a little bit from the employee resource group side of things. Um, so I co-chair the Women in Tech Plus Allies group, and we've been collecting demographics in our community for a couple years now. Um, and something we're committing to is more collaboration across ERGs. I know the, the pol political sphere of ERGs at Harvard is different. Some folks are funded, some folks aren't funded. Um, we, had, we got some funding from the Harvard University IT department to hire a student intern. So we're able to get some funding that way, but the staff leaders are still all volunteer based. Um, but something we've seen in our demographics is that our predominant audience is white women in IT here at Harvard. And it would be easy for us to say, oh, it's like a pipeline thing. That's just how IT is at Harvard. But we're not going to say that. We're actually trying to commit to doing more collaborations across ERGs, you know, even though some are funded, aren't funded, some are under human resources, some aren't under under human resources, um, and really do more collaborative work with an intersectional lens so that, again, coming back to that, that point of collective liberation and collective action and tracking that through our data and making sure that we are doing better instead of just saying that's the way things are because it's Harvard. Ellen, did you want to jump in? Um, I don't have a lot to add. I think that's right on what Kathy and Anisha said. Um, the one thing on the the unpaid work piece, I'll just say, um, I think the Phillips Brooks House Association has a good model. Um, they have the stride or the Chan stride um, uh, program, which pays um, uh, pays for students work study or folks who, um, because of undergrads, folks who are not work study eligible because they're fully grant funded um, to do service work and provides additional support and programming. And so I think that, um, that that's a that has been an impactful model there that kind of um, creates equity, right? Not everyone is eligible for that program, but it has an analysis of who who who's the most important to be doing that work and how can we resource them and provide additional support beyond just resourcing folks. So just lifting up that example, but um, yeah, totally resonate with whatever. Well, thank you so much. And we went over time, but um, I think this was an amazing just 
incredibly uplifting, empowering panel. And I feel so privileged to have been able to do this panel with all of you. So thank you so much. And thank you for all the panelists and Will um, for monitoring the chat and the questions. Um, and I hope that this will become a trigger for even more uncomfortable conversations regarding this very critical um, issue. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the week.